I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, uh, Tim Jenkinson. Uh, is professor of finance at the Oxford uh, School uh, at um, the sorry the Science School at Oxford University. Um, Tim and I are are longtime collaborators on research, so it's exciting to have him here um, speaking about entrepreneurship. Uh, he is uh, one of the leading researchers in this area and uh, is going to tell us about a current project looking at um, entrepreneurs versus venture capitalists and how terms are set um, between these two important parties. So, Tim. <coughs> Great. Thanks very much, Craig. And it, <laughs> nice to be here virtually. It would be nice to be in Florida, I'm sure, from uh, I'm sitting in right, slightly rainy Oxford at the moment. But um, maybe what I'll do is I'll share my screen and I've got a short presentation um, just to set, set the scene for what the, the question is. And it's in, in a way, it's in the title that what we wanted to look at was how do the contracts which VCs and entrepreneurs negotiate evolve over over the life of the venture. Um, and um, this is important, obviously, because, because ventures, uh, new ventures raise capital at multiple rounds. And, um, and there's various databases out there which actually have, um, have information on this, but they don't normally enable you to sort of look at it carefully over time and how the, how the rounds actually evolve. And so um, this, it, uh, along with uh, Diane Fu and Chris Ralph, my co-authors here, we decided to, to go and try to find this information about how the, um, how the contracts evolved over time and across rounds. Um, and um, so what I'm going to do is, is, to, is to show you some facts. Uh, it's mainly descriptive, actually, but I think it, it, it is, does give you some maybe some interesting, certainly gave us some interesting in, insights into the way that uh, um, the way financing is, is raised. Um, now, just to sort of preface this, there are, I think most people who are practitioners in the industry, certainly in the in the US would say, well, there's a fairly standard way to do this. Um, and, you know, because there are, there are uh, transaction costs involved in coming up with a new sort of contractual form every time and various other reasons. Um, but uh, uh, what we wanted to see was, well, we're not just interested in the initial contract that, that gets negotiated, but actually how does it evolve over, over the various rounds? And in particular, do later investors get better or worse deals? Uh, is there renegotiation of the terms of the existing investors? Uh, which which clearly could happen as well, and we're going to uh, give some facts on 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 all those uh, on all those topics. So, just by way of background, um, we know that contracting in the venture space is particularly challenging because there's such a there's such a problem of asymmetric information, or in fact, lack of information. You don't really know how many of these ventures are going to succeed. Um, you don't necessarily know whether the the entrepreneurs are trustworthy, are they going to use the, 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 the capital for what they say, or indeed whether the VCs are going to deliver the, the support they say they're going to deliver. So there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty. And for that reason, the initial contracts may well be incomplete and might well get renegotiated over time. Um, and uh, certainly, I think when most of us as academics first come to this area, we think, gosh, well, how does that happen? You know, how do you actually set a contract which is specific to a, a particular uh, new venture? And how, how different will they be across ventures? Um, and what we, the, 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 the second aspect to this is clearly that the investors get different terms from the entrepreneurs. So I'm going to take as given the fact that the vast majority of entrepreneurs get common stock when they, when they uh, um, uh, as, as their form of ownership of the company, but that uh, the investors get preferred stock, um, which has various features, which which give it um, sort of additional additional cash flow and control rights often over the common stock. Um, and this has led to a little bit of a debate about whether given that there are sort of two different types of uh, stock, does it make sense to, when we see these valuations of companies which, are, which appear in the press, which are normally based on the price of the latest funding round, whether if that funding round has particularly attractive terms, maybe relative to the previous terms and the common stock, whether it really makes sense to value a company based upon the price of the most recent round. Um, now, 
The way I've said it, said it, the answer to that must clearly be no, because if you've got apples and oranges, you can't price the, the, the value of your basket of fruit by just using the price of oranges, if, if you like a pr preferred stock. But what we're going to show is that actually, as you get on to the, as you, as you progress through funding rounds and become more successful, I think our view is, is that the true economic value does actually start to equate to the headline value. And we'll cut, I'll explain that in a little bit. And that's what I mean by the, the sort of the last bullet there is, are some unicorns mythical? Um, so are, are they real or not? Um, and so what we're going to do is, is try to answer some of those, so it's, those questions. Like, what is there a default contract? Does it vary over time? And how does it vary over time? Um, so just to give you a bit, a bit of background on data, this is very difficult uh, uh, stuff to get data on. That's not to say there aren't databases which have bits of this sort of uh, data out there, but actually to see the way that the terms evolve over time um, is complex because they can actually, you know, the terms can get overwritten by later rounds and very often databases will only, will only uh, capture the, the the latest terms or the original terms um, and so what we do is we actually um, focus on eight key contractual terms which are here on this slide in, in yellow um, and uh, use as our source the uh, certificates of incorporation which have to be filed by companies every time a new class of stock is issued um, now the in the past this has been a very painful thing to do because um, these these uh, uh, filings had to be done in sort of PDF form and you could only really get them by going to various government offices and actually looking at them. Um, but there has been, um, there, ha there are now some databases which are scanning these documents and providing them to you over the internet. Having said that, these are still PDF documents, so it is really still very, very painful to get this data out. Um, you might think there was machine learning or AI that you could do to, to, to extract that, and that might come in the future, but it's actually quite difficult because if you read the documents, there is a there are subtle differences between the, between the terms. So what we do is we go to these COIs and we extract uh, lots of deal level and round level information, um, uh, and we supplement that, although I'm not going to talk too much about it here in this presentation, with various other things we're, we're we're writing a an academic article on this as well where we will look at the um, get information on the actual who the investors were whether the investors followed on from round to round um and various other other aspects uh, also aspects about the entrepreneurs whether they were repeat entrepreneurs whether they had previous failed uh, ventures or successful ventures and things like that because we think that those sorts of terms might affect the negotiating power um, of the entrepreneur relative to the VC. Um, so these are the eight terms that we're going to focus in on. Um, I won't go through them in detail. Um, I think most of the, the people on this call probably know most of what those are about. I, I'll give some flavor to them as I, as I use some of the, um, I'll, I'll, as I present some of the evidence, but I won't go through them uh, in, in detail, explain them now. Um, I want to talk about the methodology because when you start this problem, uh, we, we, we were wondering how to actually characterize what we wanted to capture. And um, the, uh, the way we do this is what we call a three-dimensional approach. And I hope the, the, the little graph at the bottom right of the screen here uh, it sort of explains it clearly. So I'm going to start by going down the diagonal and explaining the terminology. So the, what we're calling... The, the terminology we're using is SARA, I mean Series A round A. We're going to distinguish between series and rounds. So you could have the, 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 each of the rounds, each of the Series A, the Series A stock will be negotiated at round A. So that's Series A round A. Um, series B will be negotiated at round B. That's Series SR, SBRB. So going down the diagonal. And we can see the terms that are offered to the investor at each of those rounds um, and, and track that over time. But equally, there is what we call the vertical analysis can be what happens to the series A um, uh, terms at round B. So does the do the series A contracts get renegotiated at round B and at round C and at round D? And that's where we're going down 
the vertical axis. Um, and similarly, at any given round, say in round D, you can look back across all the rounds and say, so did, did one set of, did, were all the terms the same? Did one set of investors have better terms than the, than the others? Um, and so you can also do that sort of what we call a horizontal analysis, where we look at any point in time, what the distribution of the rights are across those rounds. And so that's what we're going to, to look at. And that's what I mean by the evolution of contracts is that we don't just look at the diagonal approach, which is what you, which is, which is certainly very interesting, but we also look at whether there's renegotiation of rights and where you end up at the end of the day. Um, we're going to do this for, for 300 companies. Um, that might not sound very many, uh, but actually the, the, the number of companies in the database um, is about 3,000. Um, and uh, of those, not all of them are, have a complete set of COIs. Um, and uh, so we randomly pick 300 of these. To give you a sense of the scale though, that we have about uh, 1,200 funding rounds over those, uh, over those uh, companies. So there's a lot of documents to read manually and then code them up. And so that's what we, that, that, that's what we do in this paper, is basically track those, track those 300 or or 12, 300 companies and 1,200 funding rounds. So to start off with, I'm going to talk about what the initial contract looks like, because that's the sort of first contract, the Series A round A. I should say what we define as the initial contract is the Series A round. We know there are seed rounds, there's sometimes multiple seed rounds, but we start with the sort of first institutional round, as it were. And we look at these eight terms and see how they, how they differ across rounds. And what we find is that the initial contract is very, there is a sort of default contract, which applies in, in, um, in the majority of cases. Um, and so the way that we, we, we set that up is we basically say, we, we define the, that the most common observation we see uh, as being uh, uh, with a numerical value. So, so for example, here, the, the, in the case of, for example, LP, which is, um, which is liquidation participation. That means do you get participating preferred shares or just convertible preferred? We don't see that very often, so we set the default at zero. But if it exists, if, if you do have liquidation participation, we, call, we give that a value of one. Um, similarly, maybe a bit more intuitively with voting shares, the most common votes per share is one, but when we see something which is different from that, we give it a value and you'll see that on one, one uh, annoying uh, company in our sample, they had the preferred shareholders had 10 votes per share. Um, but in 97.24% of the cases, the initial round, a series A round, they had one vote per share. And so I think the first initial thing that we can see is that there is this clustering around these sorts of default values um, between sort of 70 and 100% of the of the uh, contracts have um, on each on each of the contractual terms has the same term, and what that adds up to is fifty five percent of the ventures in our sample have all these default values. Um, so they you know they don't have an IPO ratchet. They have they have broad based weighted average price protection, one vote per share, etc. And that's a major, as I say, a majority of them actually have that. So the first answer is that to the question is there is a surprise it perhaps surprising or um, may not be surprising to those in the industry but might be surprising to academics that you know that there is actually um, a default contract which is fairly well defined which is used in a major in a, in a slim majority of cases um, obviously whenever you have the chance to to vary anything people and especially when you've got lawyers involved you might well push away from the default contract and that's and that's also uh, what we see but that's the first finding, if you like. And now we're going to see how those things change over time. Um, just before I go into the changes, we also looked at the dispersion uh, between the different types of um, the different contractual terms. And so here, what we're doing is we're saying, well, if, if there is dispersion, what percentage of the companies deviate from it and how large is the dispersion? So we try to quantify it. If you like, that's a bit difficult. Um, it's easy with votes per share. But most of them we're sort of setting at, 
zero, one, two, three sort of values. So, you know, for example, you know, when you have anti-dilution protection, we've got three or four different variants of that, which go from investor friendly um, to, to entrepreneur friendly, and we give them numbers uh, to capture that. And you'll see that there, there is um, uh, you know, a reasonable amount of, that, or there is some dispersion um, across all those terms. Um, and so we, we, we do that. And, um, and then we, we basically look at if it's not a default contract, then is it more or less investor friendly? And that's in the table two at the bottom. And you'll see that, as I say, about 54% uh, of, the, the, um, uh, of them adopt the default contract. Where they, they don't, it's more, invest, it's, it's more often than not investor friendly by our definition. Um, and only in 5% of the cases do we actually see um, the uh, initial terms on the Series A being more, uh, more um, uh, entrepreneur friendly or less investor friendly. Interestingly, that I don't think it's, we're, the, our sample size is a bit small to say much about this, but if you're saying, is it more likely you'll raise an additional round if you have different types of, of contract, you can see that, uh, you know, actually the default contract there's more follow-on rounds from a default contract than there is from the more investor-friendly contract. Um, we don't really have any great um, uh, sort of uh, theory as to why that might be, and, this, and the differences are quite small. But we can start, as we build up the data, we can start to look at, uh, at analysis like that. Okay, so just going um, briefly through the, 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 the three different directions of analysis. So what we do here is in the diagonal analysis, remember, we're looking at, at how how the uh, rights change um, across rounds. And so what we're gonna do is look at the, how the rights change from one round to the next one, the preceding round. So A to B, B to C, C to D. Um, and uh, here you can see that, um, for example, I won't go through all this data, it's a very busy chart, but I'll give you a sense as to what's going on there, is that in the panel A, you can see that as you go from A to B, um, that uh, conditional upon you actually getting to series B, of course, because a lot of them don't get to series B if they have a series A contract, but conditional upon getting another round of funding, 71.5% of them are actually still, they, they, they have the same rights as the previous uh, round. And as we know, the, the majority, the most of those actually have the, the, um, the default contract. Um, and we can see that that goes down over time, over the rounds, so that the probability of staying the same as you go from E to F is under 60%. And you can see that the, the probability of if you change that they become more senior goes up over time as well. Although it's not, in, it's not unheard of to see actually the Series F having more junior terms than the Series E. So we're seeing quite a lot of heterogeneity here. And I should say that some of those things which come in late on the day are things like IPO ratchets, which are very investor friendly and generally are not given to necessarily to the previous rounds. They're, they're very often just the last round. Um, we also then look at what happens in panel B of what happens if it was in fact the default contract to begin with. So panel A was about all of the, all of the initial, all of the, the rounds, but, but panel B just says, if you had the default contract in series A, there's a 93% chance you'll also have it in series B. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then you can sort of roll the clock forward and you see the probabilities go down a bit, but it's still very high that you'll actually end up all the way through with the same contract. Um, I won't go through the rest of that slide. Uh, it's all in the pack and it basically describes what happens if you didn't adopt the default contract. Um, so terms remain sticky and there is a, an element of mean reversion in the sense that what we see is that if you see initial contracts are sort of uh, are, are more investor friendly, then they sort of become less investor friendly as you as, as rounds go on. That's the sort of the some of the, the figures that we've got there in bold um, and vice versa for if they were less investor friendly to begin with. Um, so just to sort of sum that up, the, the sort of what we could show is the default contract persists over the round. So that, as we said, 54% of them start off with the default contract. And then what we see actually is some even 
um, even though the, the sample size is going down, the proportion that have the default contract in series B is actually higher. Um, and it sort of sticks at this sort of 40 or 50% until you get to the later rounds when they basically become more investor friendly. And that's when things like IPO ratchets kick in. And we see them a lot more, a lot more often in our data. Um, so that's the diagonal analysis. In terms of the vertical, which is what happened, whether there are revisions to past uh, contracts uh, as you raise another round. So what happens to series A when a series B contract comes along? You can see that in panel A, we look at the proportion of the companies that do not, um, do not uh, revise the, the, the term. So they basically stay the same, um, staying between rounds. You can see that it is about two thirds of the companies um, would stay the same uh, over the first, the A, B and C rounds. Then it goes down a bit so that there, there, there does tend to be the series A terms might get revised or they're, or they're sort of the, where they sit in the pecking order becomes revised as, um, as the series E and F rounds come in. So for example, if you were, if you were to come in and say, you know, at series A, you were, you were, um, you had liquidation preference pari passu with with A and with uh, B and C rounds. You might find that you're not pari passu with D and E, and that would be a change in the rounds, which would become which would be making become junior, if you like. And we do see that the that the rounds are more like the early rounds are more likely to become junior to the later rounds, and they are to become um, to to become uh, to senior. So. Um, so we see that um, you know that that there's uh, again quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of stickiness here um, in terms of maybe less renegotiation than you might think. But what we think is important here is is that a lot of the investors are actually the same across rounds as well. So therefore, there's this sort of overlapping investors, which means that it's it's perhaps understandable that you don't renegotiate the terms if you're in A and B, and then. If you've got investors who are in B and C, they're going to they're going to stick to the, the term B rounds, um, and so um, that's what's happening sort of on renegotiation. In terms of the horizontal analysis, this is looking at at a given funding round. Um, you know, which which ser uh, are, are the terms all the same, or are some series um, uh, more senior or junior than than the than the others? Um, and what we find is that, is that, um, that uh, in less than a third of the cases um, is the uh, latest round the most investor friendly compared to all the previous rounds. So, you know, it does happen, um, but it's not axiomatic that, um, you know, the, the latest rounds always have, always have the best terms. In fact, you know, in the majority of cases, um, uh, that's not uh, that. That's not the case. And we can see the things that start to kick in here are things like IPO ratchets, as I've mentioned before. And sometimes you see that uh, you, know, you you don't often see that uh, that, for example, liquidation multipliers uh, get uh, get worse over time. In fact, normally, very high per, per, per percentage of cases, then you know the ninety seven close to 100% of cases, the, the best liquidation multiplier um, is, uh, is, is for the latest rounds. Um, but, but what we've got here is, is that, um, you know, the, those latest rounds, of course, if, they're being, if, the, if the venture is being very successful, it's interesting as to what the, what the value of the different terms is. You can certainly see the value of an IPO ratchet, which might say, when you go IPO, you guarantee us a certain price. But maybe some of those other things, like liquidation preferences, um, don't matter so much because it's much by that stage. It's very likely that you're going to convert into the ordinary shares anyway. Um, and uh, uh, of course, things like liquidation participation still are valuable at that stage because it's still you can still benefit from that. But um, what we find is is that uh, you know, it's, as I say, it's not always the case that the um, that the latest round actually has the best. And sometimes they actually bizarrely even have the worst. So it's almost like the, the entrepreneur is very strong at that stage, can take money from anybody. Uh, there's people desperate to get in and invest in the company and, and that they don't have to give away too much. <laughs>
Um, so what does that sort of tell you about unicorns, if you like, coming back to it at the end? I think there's been this debate in the, lit in the academic literature about the apples and oranges issue. Um, but I suppose our, our perspective on this is that by the time that you get to these very late rounds, um, for one thing, the, the, the last rounds don't always have sort of super terms attached to them, super, super senior uh, terms attached to them, which definitely do have value and would make it the price of those rounds not at all indicative of what the price of the other securities are outstanding at that time. But for the ones which are pretty plain vanilla, have essentially stuck to the, the same terms throughout the funding rounds and are now the probability that the investors will will um, will stick to their preferred shares is virtually zero. In other words, they will convert into ordinary shares when when uh, 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 when when an exit happens. Um, and maybe in the case of a of an acquisition, when when you know the the the, the liquidation preference may you know may again not be worth so much because there is enough money to go around and you're better off converting into ordinary shares. We think that the value of the preferred shares should be, broadly speaking, very similar to the value of the ordinary shares. Um, and so therefore, the price of these, um, the, the, the valuations that we see, the headline valuations for later stage successful ventures may be very close to their headline value. Um, there's lots more that I could say, but I, I'll finish at that point um, and just put up a summary slide and uh, very happy to answer any questions there are if we've got time. Great. Um, thank you, Tim. So um, a few questions. Um, we probably have time to maybe just do a couple. So, I mean, I, th I think this is really interesting. It, it sort of, in my mind, suggests that there's some trade-off between kind of renegotiation costs, um, the, the complexity of these contracts, and what might be optimal. Because you can imagine that, you know, that you want to provide different incentives um, to different types of, of entrepreneurs and investors, and, and this may change over the life cycle of a company. So have you thought at all about how you might get at whether changes in terms are sort of moving in a direction that, you know, kind of increases value? It's what you'd want to see from a from sort of a, a positive economic contribution versus um, maybe rent seeking on the part of certain investors or the entrepreneur, you know, like how do you think about potentially unpacking the the kind of broader economic welfare issues? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And it's sort of, I mean, the, the one thing I haven't been, I haven't mentioned at all, if you like, the, the dog that hasn't barked is, is valuations, right? So what I've been talking about is contract terms, but the other aspect to this is what value do you get at each funding round? So if you are a very, if you're doing extremely well, there's two ways in which you as an entrepreneur could, could, sort of benefit from that and you could sort of get that that right the right incentives one of which is you could renegotiate the terms of the contract and give them more rights give them more cash flow rights voting rights uh, you, you you could reduce the you could try to reduce the um the liquidation preference on the preferred stock or things like that you could you could argue about those things i think our evidence is that you sort of don't do that that probably the negotiation is about the value at that stage. And so there's an old saying, I think, which is your value, my terms, my terms, your value, you choose. Um, so, you know, if you're doing very well, you might well say, well, OK, we've got our existing terms, which we've got. It's going to be a lot of transaction costs and, and angst to renegotiate those. So maybe at that stage, what we do is we, we argue about the price. And um, that's an easier discussion to have. Than, um, than changing the terms. Having said that, we do see the terms changing. And obviously, as each investor round comes in, they're arguing not just about the value, which they have to do because it's a new round, but they're also arguing, you know, there are changes in the terms. So I think until we have really good data on the that whether there is, how that trade-off works, I think we won't have a, a, full, a full sight of this. And that data is super hard to get, actually, because... You know, it often doesn't need to be revealed, and there are various databases which which have claim they have it. But um, I think that 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 will be the that will be the added extra here, which will help us answer your question. Um, yeah. Well, 
Well, it, it sounds like um, you've got a busy research agenda and going to keep a lot of PhD students busy for for years in the future with this with this project. Um, there's there's um, several other questions that came in um, uh, to the Q and A during the talk, and I'll forward those on. Um, and I, I do want to remind folks that um, that this presentation, along with um, uh, other presentations, are available on the website uh, and through the Frontiers of, of Entrepreneurship. Um, trends report. So thank you very much, Tim. Very, very much uh, um, appreciate you coming and, and um, presenting that.